hello everybody and welcome to the most awesome panel at Super Mobility. <laughs> this is actually truly my favorite panel. It's so delightful to get all four of you together. And you know, it's impossible for any 3-2 decision up here, so that's kind of a bonus for all of us, right? <laughs> Um, so, uh, I think as everyone in this audience probably knows, we have Commissioner Mignon Clyburn, Jessica Rosemorsel, Ajit Pai, and Mike O'Reilly. We love you all. <laughs> um, you guys have had a very busy 2015 at the FCC on wireless issues. AWS 3, the incentive auction, 3.5 gigahertz, just to name a few. Um, so we welcome you here to Super Mobility, where we are grateful for all of the work that you do, all of that all the work that we do depends on the work that you do because it depends on Spectrum. So um, last year I decided that panels, having sat on them, were kind of just a little dry. So we decided to make it a game. So it's still a panel, <laughs> but it's kind of a game. It's a, it's a panel with a game. How about that? So we're building, um, much like all of CTIA, we're trying to build it and make it better and better. So this year we've gone fully wireless. Okay, we've got beautiful display here. Um, behind every app on the phone, there's a question. Uh, you just select the app that you want and it will reveal the question. I get to play the role of Siri, Google, Cortana, or Alexa, depending on who you like, and I'll read aloud. We love all of the operating systems at CTIA. <laughs> um, so the first shot at an answer goes to the commissioner who, selected, who selects the app, and it's a jump ball after that, so if anybody wants to jump in, then we'll have a discussion. Um, we're going to start in the order of how close to Charleston, South Carolina you grew up. <laughs> so I think that means Commissioner Clyburn goes first. Thank you. I'll take lifeline for 100, please. There you go. <laughs> All right. 88% of the eligible low-income lifeline subscribers select wireless options today. How can the FCC make sure a modernized lifeline program continues to reflect low-income consumers' preference for mobile solutions. What we have to do, well, let me first say uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I feel like a star, um, and I sound like a star. I don't know how I sound like to you, but from here, I sound fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I'm passionate about this particular prop topic, it probably didn't surprise you that um, I chose it first. Um, it is a program for the past 30 years, um, has had a remarkable, ambitious type of objective, but respectfully, it is a program that is in much need of recalibration, so to speak, and I would be very kind by saying that. This is a program that recognizes that there are economic barriers for a number of individuals in this nation that we should solve. So one reason, uh, one way, I think the chief way that we could do the best job of totally fixing this program is to sunset it. To get rid of Lifeline Wet as we know it and reinstitute a program that is actually a bridge to prosperity. And to take out our 20th century FCC blinders and, and really look at how we promote competition uh, and consumer, uh, you know, cons consumer uh, objectives. I think consumers uh, need to have the ability to choose. So choice and competition to me when it comes to Lifeline is at the center. And really reformatting this program to ensure that we have this, the protocols in place that are needed to uh, make it a 21st century program, a program that is uh, dignified, a program uh, that is a bridge uh, to prosperity to the future. So we need to take ownership of it. Uh, we need to get the providers out of the uh, certification business, and we need to make sure that we do not have second-class service, no more de minimis services. Um, we need this program to be one that consumers would want to sign up for and that is, is uh, the proper oversight uh, is in place. That is a very good answer. Now, see, Commissioner Clyburn thinks that we're going to give the winner the connected car from the stage this morning. <laughs> but we checked with ethics, and the winner gets nothing but our awe and praise. But would anybody else like to answer? That's too bad, because my car, again, last year I told you, I have 306,000 miles. If anyone on the stage needs a car, it's Mignon. That is too bad. <laughs> um, anybody else want to take a stab at Lifeline? 
I'll happy to jump in since uh, Commissioner Clyburn and I have done a, quite a roadshow on this, uh, this discussion for, for a good while. I think we share so many uh, common thoughts on this issue and there's so much good work ahead to be done. I think we can find uh, agreement uh, if we all put to, uh, good, uh, good thoughts together. And, and one of the things that I've been pushing hard for is an overall budget. I think it's the, it, well, it is the one piece of our universal service programs that do not have a budget. Um, I personally would, would be favoring a cap, but I'm inclined to, to try and find more commonality and move towards a budget. So I think there's some, some ways to, to do so, and I think it, hopefully by the end of the year, we can find something that we all can agree on. That'd be my goal. Great. So um, this was actually a harder task than I thought how far you live from Charleston, South Carolina. So you may think, Mike O'Reilly, that coming from Lockport, New York, at 887 miles, you would be next, <laughs> but you're not. It is actually Commissioner Rosenworcel's turn. Hartford, <laughs> Connecticut is 877, only 10 miles, but you're still the winner for next up. <laughs> I always seem to be losing. <laughs> yeah, talk for Buffalo. No. <laughs> All right, um, it's a privilege to be here on this game show. I think I'm going to choose 5G. Well, we know that's a winner. Okay, so the U.S. is the global leader in 4G. What steps can the FCC take to help ensure that we retain our lead in 5G? We are the global leader in 4G. We have 5% of the world's population, but one-third of its 4G deployment. But laurels are not good resting places, so I think we have to start moving on 5G. Because today, the bulk of our spectrum activity when it comes to mobile takes place at three gigahertz or below. But going forward, we are gonna have to bust through that ceiling all the way up to 24 gigahertz or perhaps even as high as 90 gigahertz. We are going to have to look to infinity and beyond and then we're going to have to combine those stratospheric frequencies with dense networks of small cells. And if we do that right, we will have higher speeds with our wireless networks than we have ever seen before. And I think that is what 5G is going to look like. And I think we need to get moving because the rest of the world is already onto this. We have in Japan, an effort to make sure that multiple cities are ready for 5G by the 2020 Olympics. And in South Korea, there are efforts to have trials in place for the 2018 Olympics. Our friends in the European Union have now signed up and are working with Japan and South Korea. And meanwhile, in China, we have multiple ministries that are working on developing standards for 5G. All of that means that our advantage in 4G is terrific, but it's not a given that we will again be leading in 5G. So there are things we need to do right now, and here are two of them. First, we need to make sure that we issue a rulemaking on really high spectrum bands, millimeter wave spectrum, as soon as possible. We have a notice of inquiry, we should move forward and try to make it happen with a rulemaking. And then we need to take those spectrum bands we identify in that rulemaking and head to the World Radio Conference in Geneva this fall and convey to the rest of the world that these are bands we've identified for 5G service so we can get the dialogue going and we can be at the front of the pack when it comes to 5G, just as we've been with 4G. Now, see, if I were Jimmy Fallon and she were Selma Hyatt, I would give her a puppy for that answer. Yeah. <laughs> I like puppies. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> All right, Commissioner O'Reilly, you are up next I, at 877 miles. Was, what, I'm sorry. Say, 877 miles, you get to go next. Oh, goodness gracious, all right. Um, how about, well, I was going to just follow up on her. Oh, well, comments. please do, because you know what? Our board thinks 5G is really important, too. We just approved an action item, so let's hear, let's no, hear, sure. like, but this well, should be an all play. No, I, I, I just wanted to, to, to compliment my colleague on, on such good thoughts. I think we've been, I think this is another area of commonality we can find on 5G. There's a number of issues we need to move forward. The NOI, the moving into an NPRM is something we need to do in quick order. Um, I'm going to hopefully be at work in, in defending the United States uh, in Geneva later this year, so I intend to, to, 
take the actions of the Commission forward uh, and make sure our partners in the world know that we are not going to sit back and let them dictate how the next standard is built and what it means for our wireless community. We have all the capabilities and the innovation necessary to succeed in this, and my colleague is so right, we can't sit rest on our laurels. The Commission has a role, the industry has a role, and I think we can all do that together. Commissioner Pye, do you love, do you love wireless and 5G? <laughs> I do love wireless, I do love 5G. Okay. Uh, I also love CTIA, so thanks for having us all here. Uh, I, I agree with everything that uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel and Commissioner O'Reilly said, and it's one thing to hear about it in theory, but to see it in practice is really amazing. Uh, earlier this year, I had the chance to see uh, Samsung's 5G lab down in Dallas. It's really incredible to see multiple gigabits uh, sent wirelessly using super high uh, frequency spectrum. Earlier today, about an hour and a half ago, I got to see another uh, 5G demonstration, over three gigabits per second. Uh, using a, a high band channel. I mean, that's really game changing potential at 14.4 uh, gigahertz. And so I agree that we should uh, think very creatively and flexibly about how to use some of this spectrum that was long thought to be useless uh, for wireless services and uh, put it to its best use. There's no consensus definition on what 5G is, but there is agreement that it could be a path breaking. Wireless. Look at all of this agreement. I know, you know, it, 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 flexible use policies, efficient, user intensive. Yeah, yeah we keep going. Games. We might, uh, we might yeah, win. We, we might win this game yet. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Commissioner Riley, you're up. Oh sure. Um, how about infrastructure? Infrastructure. Okie doke. The commission has taken a number of important steps to help facilitate wireless siting across the country. Thank you all very much. Um, as we see the proliferation of more small cell solutions, what else can the government do to promote more mobile broadband development? So I want to thank for the kind words uh, to, for the Commission's past work, but what we need to do is build upon that work. And I was pushing really hard in the Commission to take the action that we did do, but now we have the opportunity to move forward. That means the work that we did on small cells, we need to expand that. So it's no longer facilities that are already built, it needs new areas as well. So we have to take advantage of all the opportunities. And, and I know this is not a word that like to be said publicly, but I'm happy, you know, I'm, I think it's only appropriate. We're gonna also need preemption. We're gonna have to take advantage of the statute and what's built that Congress provided us and preempt in some instances localities um, that are being a, a obstructionist in terms of the build out of infrastructure. We need the infrastructure, the consumers want the infrastructure and the benefits that come from it, and that means sidestepping another, a number of barriers that are in the way, and I'm pleased to, to lead forward on that issue. Well, we are grateful for that too. Did you want to add, anybody want to add anything to that? Oh, sorry, Jessica, did you want to uh, just a couple of things. Uh, so I, I agree with uh, my colleague that we did uh, move the ball forward recently, and I think that uh, there are some uh, promising steps that we've taken. In particular, we're still uh, formulating a programmatic agreement that I think will help streamline uh, the deployment of small stock technologies. Two other ideas that uh, I put on the table that I would like to move forward on. One would be a deemed grant remedy to give our shot clock some teeth so that if a locality doesn't act on a particular application within a certain period of time, that application would be deemed granted. And I think under the Supreme Court's decision in the city of Arlington, we do have the authority to do that. The other thing is siting on federal land. Uh, so if you are a wireless company and you're looking to uh, deploy some infrastructure and you happen to pick a piece of private property, it takes on average two years for that process to work itself out. But if you happen to pick a piece of federal property, it can take on average four years. And it seems to me that there should be ways for us to streamline the process, given that 30% of the land of the United States is federally held, for us to streamline it in order to better serve consumers and minimize the amount of paperwork that other federal agencies have to go through. So I think there are, we've taken some good steps, but there's more uh, for us to do. You know, when I worked at CTI 18 years ago, one of our top priorities was siting on federal lands. And guess what? We're still at one of our top priorities. So we appreciate that comment. Surprisingly, military bases are one of the hardest places. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll keep at it all together. And another challenge, you know, being from Charleston, as you pointed out, thank you, is historic sites too. Mm -hmm. And so um, we are modifying and streamlining the process to make sure that if there's something either existing or there's not going to be any type of um, optical or, or any type of other interference that um, we will expedite and streamline uh, that uh, process. And I think, particularly in working in those communities like mine that um, are very, uh, uh, that are very dependent on tourism and, and, and very proud of uh, their uh, mature structures, that it's important that we work, we harmonize uh, that, uh, uh, you know, before we get to the, uh, 
the point that my colleague got. I'm not, I'm not can't afraid. say the word. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, I think it's back to Kansas we go. Parsons, Kansas. Straight out of Kansas. 1,091 <laughs> miles from Charleston. You're up. All right. Uh, I will take mobile video. A good one. Very important and huge part of our networks, as you know. Mobile video accounted for 60% of all mobile data traffic at the end of last year. And? is only projected to grow nearly nine times by the end of the decade. How do you see the marketplace for adopting this shift in consumer behavior? This is really where the rubber meets the road in a lot of ways in mobile. And I hate to extrapolate from personal anecdote, but just to give you an indication of how mobile video really is changing things. Uh, last night I caught up on an episode <laughs> of Game of Thrones, uh, watching it over my iPad on a Wi-Fi connection. Uh, this morning when I landed, I like, watched a video that my wife sent me, my kids going to preschool for the first time today, on a wireless connection, on a cellular connection. And it was really incredible how mobile video is changing the marketplace tremendously. That's a really good thing for consumers, obviously. As regulators, though, it presents some challenges. And so I think of uh, the challenge in two different parts. Uh, first, a spectrum, and then secondly, how to think about video regulation in, in particular. Uh, in terms of spectrum, obviously, mobile video use is much more bandwidth intensive, so it only underscores the need for the federal government to free up as much spectrum as possible, licensed and unlicensed, uh, for uh, wireless carriers and everybody else to use. Uh, obviously, on the license front, we have an incentive auction coming up, uh, but after that, it's uh, unclear where the next uh, frontiers are going to be in terms of spectrum. I think federal spectrum re represents a golden opportunity uh, in that regard. Also, however, in unlicensed, I think there's a lot the federal government can do, in particular in the five gigahertz band, which I think is tailor-made to be the next generation of Wi-Fi. Uh, recent, just this morning, as a matter of fact, a bipartisan group of legislators announced a, uh, that they were uh, directing the Department of Transportation, the FTC, to think about creative ways to move forward on 5.9 gigahertz spectrum in particular. So I think there are, uh, in terms of spectrum, there are ways for us to accommodate the tremendous increase in demand uh, that users are going to place on the network as a result of mobile video. Uh, also on the video regulation side, I think it's important for us to remember that mobile video is not just uh, a YouTube clip of cats playing with each other anymore. I mean, there are, as I said, you know, sort of genuine, uh, there's a real competitive threat that is placed uh, to, upon the uh, traditional video providers by mobile video uh, providers. And it seems like every single day, somebody's coming up with a new business model uh, to deliver uh, cutting edge programming to people in innovative ways. And that's part of the reason why I'm concerned about what the hints the agency has given in terms of its uh, over the top video regulation. This is a very evolving market, very innovative. There's certainly no market failure. To the contrary, as I said, people are innovating every single day. And so I think the uh, agency is best, uh, would act most appropriately if it stayed its hand in terms of trying to regulate over the top video. And mobile is a critical, critical part of that. Please. Sure. Uh, sometimes I think that there are only three things that you need to know about the future of mobile. And it's video, video, and video. <laughs> That's how dominant it is going to be. And I think it is an exciting time to be a consumer. We have all sorts of big media companies and small upstarts experimenting. Experimenting with business models, experimenting with programming, and experimenting with pricing. And I think it is absolutely critical for that experimentation to continue. And I wouldn't want to see any kind of regulatory proposals on over the top get in the way of that experimentation. Uh, one other thing I think we should pay attention to with mobile video is at the margins of our jurisdiction, but it's mobile ad blocking. I think the rise of ad blocking on mobile devices will create some pressures for monetization on mobile content going forward. And now that mobile ad blocking is becoming available in the most recent iterations of iOS and Android, I think that is also something to be mindful of because it will influence what programming is available to us on our mobile devices. Anyone else? I, would, I, I think that's a very interesting point on monetization issue. I think we're, you know, ad blocking is both beneficial to consumers but is also difficult for the industry going forward and what that means for consumers on the long run. I am concerned that in trying to 
provide benefits to consumers, we are going to cut off opportunities, or we're going to change the model. Right? I think a lot of us remember what the early days of the internet you know, looked like. It was pay, pay per sight and, and different, different uh, mechanisms you had to subscribe to. And we've moved to a more free model of the internet for exchange of different things, whether it be ads or information. And that model should not be disrupted uh, willy-nilly, in my opinion. All oh, right. Well, okay, then I think we are back to you, Commissioner Clyburn. Uh -oh. We are back up. Take a swing. <laughs> okay, let's try uh, more spectrum since we, in essence, I think it would be a good segue from where we just uh, came. Nice choice. Very nice choice. As now you know, let's see if I can. We are, think we're a fan of this one here. <laughs> uh, we need 350 megahertz of new, li new licensed spectrum by 2020. What can the FCC do to help refill the spectrum pipeline after the 600 megahertz auction? and shorten the 13-year gap it takes to reallocate spectrum. Well, one of the things that um, you know, I am I'm still amazed by is uh, what things, you use the number 13, you know, when you, 13 years ago, there was no such thing as an apps economy. Uh, you know, there was no such thing that I know about. If, if we said it was a smartphone, it surely was not the smartphones that uh, we use today. Um, today, 50% of the um, you know traffic, mobile traffic, um, you know is, is carried. Uh, traffic is carried over the internet, and so things have just uh, changed robustly. So um, what we are doing uh, with the auction authority that we have is 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 responding. I mean we're we're moving things to market. We've already made 145 uh, megahertz um, of uh, spectrum available, and we're counting. Um, I know the chairman responded to what you said. We're, 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 we're doing it, we're, we're in, we're all in. Um, and we're also, in, and my colleague, Commissioner Rosenworth, talks about this a lot. We are continuing to work with our federal partners about uh, sharing opportunities, encouraging those who hold a spectrum to really evaluate how they're using, especially underutilized uh, spectrum, and say, you know, what can we, you know, what's the best and highest use of that? So how do we encourage, um, you know, incentives? Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly just teed up something um, uh, this week that um, you know got some attention in terms of how we can um, encourage uh, uh, more uh, uh, again the best best and highest use of spectrum and encourage our federal partners to to uh, further engage and share and um, all of those things are on uh, it's an all of the above uh, approach that we are uh, using uh, for this and uh, I'm very excited about what the future will bring. And I would like to just give a shout out to Fred Moorfield, who's out here in the audience from the Department of Defense, because he is helping us, Absolutely. and he is a forward thinker, and we are grateful for you, Fred. So, of course, there are bills in Congress that will uh, continue to um, encourage uh, this type of enlightenment. And please, sure. I think it's been said before, but 13 years, you can raise a teenager in 13 <laughs> years. It shouldn't take 13 years to reallocate spectrum in the modern mobile economy. But that's what it does. I mean, I think that's crazy, and I think we need a spectrum pipeline that is more reliable, more robust, and more consistent. Today, federal authorities control roughly 60% of the choice airwaves below 4 gigahertz. And they do that for all sorts of good reasons. Those airwaves help us monitor our crops, forest fires. They help us keep planes in the skies. They help protect us through our national defense. But it's clear that those agencies don't have to internalize the cost of retaining that spectrum. And in a world where we are putting more demands on our airwaves and cramming more services into them every day, we're going to have to figure out how to reallocate some of those federal airwaves into private sector and commercial use. And I think the way we've done it historically has its limitations. When we knock on the door of those federal authorities, we then go and beg, coax, and cajole them and plead for them to give us some scraps of spectrum they might not use. It's really not the way you want to run the pipeline for the modern spectrum economy. So that's how we've been doing it. So instead, as Commissioner Clyburn acknowledged, I think we should be looking at incentives. I think every federal authority that has control over spectrum should have an incentive to be efficient with it. And they should have incentives to use it in a way where they don't occupy more than they need. 
And that means that they might get a financial benefit if they give some back so that can, we can auction it for private sector use. And if we did something like that, we would wind up in a world where when reallocation discussions started, they would see gain and not just loss. And we would have a more reliable spectrum pipeline. Commissioner O'Reilly, you want to talk about your blog we got to see this week? Well, sure. I'm, I'm happy to, to talk about it a little bit. I, I agree with my colleagues on, on their good points. And I, I agree that incentives can be one part of the equation. What I've also suggested is you need carrots and you need sticks. And while I certainly support the missions of our federal agencies and the good work that they do, we all know that it is the American people, not the federal agencies, that, are, that have the ownership of the spectrum. And we are charged with collectively, as a federal government, in trying to use the best use the best spectrum of the, the, the possible. And in doing that, I suggest and put on the table an idea that's not, I did not create, it's been one that's been talked about for quite a while, is putting an opportunity cost to those who hold spectrum in the federal government agencies. And I think the, by doing so, we make them optimize exactly what they need to hold. We actually charge today, we charge all federal agencies for everything. We, they don't get free pencils, they don't get free rent, they're obligated to pay that as part of their budget. All of the employees they have are charged against their budget. Spectrum is the one piece that they have no cost to. So sitting on it for, for whatever reason or not spending enough time to make it more efficient is not a cost to them. And so I think we need to put that cost onto their burden, uh, to, onto their, to their budget. Uh, and, and from that, we will get greater efficiencies. And I think that's something that's very important for not just the pipeline in the immediate. And I do support the works that, that, that I have worked on in the past and that the Congress is looking at it going now in terms of mandating spectrum be uh, specific bands be turned over for commercial purposes. But I think on, in co cooperation with that, we can also add uh, some type of a, of a stick approach. Um, so, Commissioner Pai, I think this has to be an all play because I seem to find that if I repeat 350 megahertz by 2020, it's effective. So, what do you think about more spectrum? <laughs> I'm in favor of it. <laughs> Fantastic. Then you get to go next. <laughs> all right. Uh, I will go with. I'm go with competition. Good choice. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Consumers benefit from the choice of four national wireless operators and multiple resellers and regional providers. How does that high degree of competition factor into your approach to wireless regulation? It informs everything I do with respect to wireless regulation. And I think that it bears mentioning over and over again that wireless really is uh, one of the crown jewels in terms of the American telecommunications system. It was not a foregone conclusion two decades ago at uh, the inception of the wireless industry that it would be so. But fast forward, and now we are the leaders in the world in terms of uh, wireless. As Commissioner Rosenworcel pointed out, uh, other countries look to us uh, for leadership. And that's because 98% of our people have access to 4G LTE. 97% of Americans have access to three, at least three facilities-based providers. Uh, we spend more, on average, twice as much as European counterparts do in terms of uh, wireless investment. And uh, we're leading the way in terms of innovation. All of this mobile economy is driven primarily from the United States. Now, that's not an accident. I don't think it's attributable solely to our entrepreneurial culture. I think it's attributable primarily to the fact that we had a bipartisan consensus in the early 1990s that wireless would not be regulated in the same way we did the wireline industry. We would take a more restrained approach, light touch regulation. And I think the results speak for themselves. And that's part of the reason why I'm distressed by recent moves at the FCC and elsewhere. Uh, to put at risk our leadership role in when it comes to wireless. Uh, for example, preemptively telling particular parties that we don't want them to even consider merging because that would disrupt how we think the market should be structured. That's not something that a leader, a government uh, should do in terms of uh, wanting to continue to lead in wireless. Uh, preemptively sending uh, not, so, uh, unsubtle, or not so subtle signals about what business plans are going to be allowed and what business plans aren't, including some consumer friendly uh, options as T-Mobile's Music Freedom, which allows people to stream music to their smartphones free, exempt from a data cap. I don't think that's what we should be doing. Uh, similarly, I think that just grasping for headlines in terms of uh, enforcement actions and sanctioning uh, companies based on rules that don't exist and network management practices that it previously had blessed is not the way to create the kind of certainty that's going to incentivize the private sector to continue taking these risks. 
And most notably, of course, uh, the elephant in the room is Title II. I think if the lesson of wireless has taught us anything, it is that wireless is not just different, but it's a magnificent success story precisely because of the restrained free market approach we've taken. There is no market failure in wireless that justified slapping uh, Title II regulations on mobile providers, uh, let alone Section 332 of the Communications Act, which I think bars, as a legal matter, the FCC from doing so. And so I think that ideally we would have recognized that the marketplace as it has developed has become very competitive and we would return to the bipartisan consensus that existed previous to 2014 and 2015 that's allowed the United States to become the world leader in wireless. So, so I, I take a slightly uh, nuanced view, I'm trying to get better, <laughs> um, of uh, what um, uh, some of the points that uh, my uh, colleague uh, made. Uh, all of, we are here and we have been beneficiaries of this, you know, robust, uh, you know, e economy, uh, you know, this, it, it's mind boggling. Uh, but not any, everybody in all corners of our nation, not everybody has benefited from this. Um, there are a number of, especially rural communities, that have two or fewer options. And what that means in those communities, those small communities, is that their prices are often higher the products are often um, less desirable. And we, as a, an agency, must keep that in front of mind when we try to weigh and balance uh, you know, policy. So uh, I, I just wanted to, 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 to uh, I guess, uh, make a notation. I'm trying to get better, y'all. Uh, make a notation here that we really have to think about the entire ecosystem and uh, particularly those rural communities, those high cost communities, and what is happening there. And um, not one size fits all as it relates to, um, you know, uh, some of the uh, uh, yeah, analysis. And so uh, that, that's why I think some of the issues that uh, you kind of teed up, that we need to take, uh, go, beneath the, uh, go beneath the next layer. Uh, you know, uh, in two, I've got some effects, some stuff I was looking for, you probably noticed in 2003, there were six nationwide uh, wireless carriers that accounted for 79% of the mobile wireless um, subscribers. Um, in 2013, uh, four nationwide carriers had a combined market share of approximately 97% of those subscribers. These are the types of things that we need to talk about and, um, and acknowledge um, at, when we uh, you know, speak about uh, what our regulatory posturing should be. So I'm playing the role of Siri, so I'll just tell all my CTIA friends that we have some work to do here in getting some of the, getting some of the facts and figures out here. We appreciate all of these. We feel it's a very competitive business, and we have a lot of great options, so we'll be buying this with you in the moment. Okay, no worries. I'll be ready. All right. Um, why don't you get to go next? You want to go next? Oh, do I? Yeah. I'm going to come up so quick. I, I don't even know what I want. I'm help. I knew you were going to chew that. <laughs> I knew you were. Um, by the end of this year, M Health could deliver up to two hundred and ninety billion in annual healthcare cost savings worldwide. What are the biggest challenges to broader M Health adoption, and what role does Spectrum play? Affordable wireless options. And that is the, the biggest barrier. And when we talk about um, you know, all of the things that I made mention uh, just now in terms of ensuring that there is competition and ensuring um, that um, uh, there is adequate um, a mobile deployment, this is going to be a key for, to realize even more of these options. You should be, not be penalized um, for where you live in terms of, of having access uh, to um, a, a doctor or to medical uh, care or health and wellness. Technology can be the, the, the key to bridging that uh, particular uh, uh, device. So you probably heard about our Connect to Health Task Force uh, that is really looking at how we leverage um, uh, you know, technology and the better delivery of, of health and wellness, how we work with our federal colleagues, and how we work with all of you to uh, ensure that we use you know, white spaces and the like that would um, provide more affordable options and opportunities um, in the, this area. You, uh, again, the, this is to me, even though you have, um, you know, teed up that, um, that's, that's just scratching a surface. I know that sounds like a big number. Um, it's just scratching the surface. So um, I'm really passionate about what we can do to make sure that people are connected at home 
that um, the one third of Americans who might not be uh, able to afford real robust broad broadband, that they um, are able and poised to do so in order for them to take advantage of um, these, uh, these opportunities that uh, M Health and other health technologies um, have to, um, are, are poised to deliver for them. Doesn't her passion show too, isn't that awesome? Um, anybody else want to talk about mHealth? It's such an amazing, life-changing, literally. Go ahead. Um, I, I love what my colleague, Commissioner Clyburn, said. The thing that strikes me most is that healthcare is a th over $3 trillion market. That's what it's going to cost us this year in this country. $3 trillion. That is a three with 12 zeros after it. <laughs> and there's all sorts of evidence that when we invest in telehealth and telemedicine, we produce better outcomes at lower cost. We should be interested in that and we should be clearing the way to make sure that we see more of those good outcomes and use more spectrum enabled solutions to make them happen. But I think the things that can actually impede the further development of telemedicine don't actually involve technology itself. They involve boundaries that our wireless airwaves don't know, but for instance, boundaries like state licensing practices for physicians and healthcare providers that prevent us from using some of these solutions because licensing is now necessary in every state. And in fact, there are about 70 jurisdictions nationwide that require physicians to get licenses. So if you want to practice using telemedicine solutions, you have to make sure you have that authority. And the same goes for malpractice insurance and reimbursement under Medicaid. And all of those things are at the margins of what people here do. But if we don't clean up our policies in the physical world, I think the possibilities of what we can do with wireless technology are going to be constrained and healthcare and slowing down the rate of growth and the costs of healthcare won't be really something that we'll be able to um, make much of a go at. So I think that in addition to the, the, all the good things we can do with healthcare and telemedicine, and using spectrum to make sure we have better outcomes at lower cost. We have to focus on some of those things that are barriers left over from the analog age. And I appreciate you talking you know, about those barriers. And, and one of the things that I hope we will discuss soon is mobility in fund two. Because again, it got to have um, a, a deployment that will enable uh, you know, further um, um, you know, opportunities. And the, the first category that I talked about in terms of lifeline. Um, again, if we do not have an affordable means by way um, of connectivity for in individuals um, who have economic challenges, then all of these things that we know could be realized will not be so. Good point. Um, Commissioner Pai, you're up. Oh, again? Yes. Right. Uh, it seems like it comes around. Yeah, I know. All right. I will take, why don't we do uh, privacy? Ooh, bold choice. <laughs> all right. Bold choice. <laughs> all righty. This fall, the FCC will be releasing an item, let's see, to address broadband privacy as a result of the open internet order. How do we best safeguard consumers' privacy, end regulatory uncertainty, and not end up with conflicting FTC, FCC mandates setting different rules for different players in our ecosystem? This is a great question, and uh, this is uh, another frontier that we uh, opened up inadvertently as a result of the open internet order. Um, as a result of that order, we essentially deprived the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, of uh, jurisdiction over a certain broadband providers' uh, privacy practices, and that's because uh, they are prohibited under the law from uh, themselves exerting jurisdiction over common carriers. Now, there are two problems with this. First, the Federal Trade Commission actually does have expertise when it comes to protecting consumer privacy. For example, Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act uh, has been interpreted them by them for a number of years in this area. There's also COPA, which they've interpreted for a number of years, and uh, their staff has worked on these issues for uh, many, many years. Uh, secondly, we, by comparison, have relatively little expertise in doing this sort of thing. In fact, uh, our forays have been somewhat disjointed uh, of late. For example, late, late last year, we issued uh, sanctions against Yortel and Terracom, two carriers that violated some amalgam of rules that we suggested existed but don't, didn't really exist, and we called the category of information they declined to protect personally identifiable information, which is something that appears nowhere in the Communications Act and certainly doesn't extend, uh, doesn't flow from our Section 222 authority. 
So I do have a, a problem uh, trying to figure out where the agency is going to go. It looks like later this fall we are going to be tackling, as uh, the question suggests, uh, the, the issue of privacy and setting forth what internet service providers can and must do in terms of protecting privacy. Uh, but there's a problem here, which is that this is a pretty dynamic ecosystem. It's not just internet service providers who have personal information of consumers. There are a great many edge providers who do as well. In fact, a number of edge providers, some of whom you can you know, you can Google it, for example, uh, their entire business model is predicated on the monetization of personal information. So we could have a situation in which internet service providers face one set of privacy regulations applied by the FCC, but edge providers are regulated by a completely different set of regulations by the Federal Trade Commission. That could create all sorts of disruptions or, or distortions in terms of the marketplace. And that, that's something that I, I worry about quite a bit as we embark upon this uh, brave new world of privacy. This is an important topic. Anybody else want to opine? I was just going to say, for the, for the couple of you in the audience that are here, I did talk about this on this stage yesterday with the FTC, and we went through the different uh, activities that they have uh, gone forth. Marino Hausen was here, and we, we interviewed each other and, and, and talked about their authority and their activities and the extensive practices and what, how they view the ecosystem and their involvement in Silicon Valley. They actually have a field office and talk to uh, talk to the players and try to understand how the how it applies to edge providers. What does it mean for the whole internet experience? And so I, I agree with my colleague. I'm extremely concerned where we're going to go uh, in the fall at some point, as indicated by the chairman. I think it has um, teen opportunities to disrupt the internet experience of consumers, and that is only bad for for the long term. Yeah, I, I, I'm extremely concerned also about consumer vulnerability. Uh, the, um, what I appreciate about what the FTC and the FCC's role, we have complementary and oftentimes overlapping uh, jurisdiction. Uh, there were a couple of cases where um, that pointed out where we can talk about you know, what is a consumer you know, sensitive information or uh, personally identifiable PII. But the fact of the matter is you've got um, Internet service providers that have very sensitive information about us. We have other carriers that have very sensitive information um, uh, about all of us. And you um, expect a cop on the beat uh, to be uh, vigilant. I'm not going to apologize um, for uh, the Enforcement Bureau and the, um, the FCC endorsing um, you know, clear uh, rules or clear expectations that we have of consumers that hold, uh, of, of providers that hold um, sensitive uh, consumer uh, information. Where the FTC may not be poised or ready to act, and we have um, under uh, 222A or 222C uh, uh, the authority and the ability to do so, um, I think it's incumbent upon us to act and to do anything less. I, I, I think, uh, I think would uh, be a regulatory malpractice. Yes, sir. Just a quick uh, uh, gloss on that. So uh, I, I think everyone agrees that consumer privacy is important. The question is, what are the rules of the road? And I would encourage everybody to, for example, look at the Enforcement Bureau's guidance from earlier this year, in which they said, stated what their expectations were of uh, internet service providers until the agency adopts formal rules. And I would challenge you if, to put yourself in the position of a business in possession of consumer proprietary network information which is what we have authority under Section 222 to regulate, and try to figure out what's prohibited and what's not. For example, the Enforcement Bureau guidance says, we expect internet service providers to adopt privacy protections in keeping with core basic, with the tenets of core basic privacy protections. That's an actual quote. I have no idea what that means. No, no one knows what that means. And so, yes, we agree on a 60,000 foot level that privacy is important, but aside from the fact that we now have dueling jurisdictions in addition to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and whoever else wants a piece of the privacy pie, so to speak, we now have a very uncertain environment in which companies have no idea what the law is and how to comply with it. What they do know is that the FCC is going to come down on them like a ton of bricks for violations that heretofore didn't seem uh, to be based on any legal authority that they could discern. Well, the chairman announced that um, you know he will uh, launch a process, um, you know, with respect to uh, Section uh, 222 for broadband internet access service, and I encourage uh, you know all of us to uh, to, to weigh in accordingly. 
But I think that that point's indicative, though. The, the chairman's going to issue new rules. That's what his goal is. New rules on privacy on very thin ice in terms of authority that my colleague already highlighted. And if you look at what's already been done at the commission so in the last many months, you see they're creating terms that don't exist in the statute to get to an end goal. If they have this desire, then go to Congress and get it authorized and have Congress say, we want the FCC to do this, not the FTC. But if you actually look what Congress is doing and look at the activity in the different committees, you'll see just the opposite. They are trying to preserve the FTC's authority over this space. And so it's nice to say, well, we're going to have an open process, but it actually means we're going to have rules and that's going to have burdens for all the providers. And to say, you know, we, we, we like to throw around these terms, well, it's just for the, it's just for the ISP. It's just for the network itself. But we all know that the, the lines between a network and between an edge provider are blurring. They aren't crystal clear. Everyone's getting into each other's business. We've seen the dynamic um, activity. If you go to the floor today, you'll see what everyone's trying to do. Uh, they're not necessarily one thing. I was thinking of this, this universe earlier today. What, where do you put cloud in the universe? Is cloud a network or is cloud a service? Oh, very interesting question. Do you want the FCC regulating the cloud? Well, you want FC you're regulating the cloud privacy of users? Very, very troubling issues that we're getting into, uh, and we're going to have some kind of new rules. Commissioner Rosenworcel, you can, you can, you have an option. How about this? You, you want this one? Okay. No, I'm absolutely certain of one thing. We're not going to solve privacy on this stage today. I think well, I just solved it. <laughs> so I'm going to say licensed versus there unlicensed. There we go. There we go. go. I bet we can yeah. agree on this one. Yeah. CTIA is a strong advocate for making both licensed and unlicensed spectrum available. How can we best work together to ensure all spectrum users have access to all types of spectrum? Great question. <laughs> um, I bet everyone in this room has used a little bit of unlicensed spectrum today. Uh, Wi-Fi is perhaps the, one of the greatest spectrum success stories from the FCC over the last three decades. And uh, unlicensed spectrum generally is a terrific thing. It provides internet access, an on-ramp for people who may not have any other form of getting online. It provides a space for permissionless innovation. And of course, it helps, helps operators manage their network. About half of the data traffic today is at some point offloaded from licensed to unlicensed spectrum. And even better, if you add it all up in this country, it contributes $140 billion of economic activity every year. So we should want more of this stuff. It's good stuff. But the challenge is that the way that spectrum gets considered in the legislative process, it's not always easy. That's because when the Congressional Budget Office takes a look at spectrum policy, it gives high marks to licensed spectrum and low marks to unlicensed spectrum, disregarding all that economic benefit it can provide. So it's my hope going forward that as we develop the next generation of spectrum legislation, we make sure that in that legislation, we think about unlicensed, because it's so important for innovation, so important for the economy, and it helps licensed spectrum operate. And I think it's important that in that next generation of spectrum legislation, we have a cut for unlicensed or a Wi-Fi dividend that's included so that some additional airwaves are set aside for unlicensed spectrum because we all use it every day. So I think um, we have, am I right, we have time for, we have, basically we have time for one more question. So I'm gonna pick it because I think it's an interesting one for everyone to answer. All of you winners, that is. Um, you have executives in your office every day pitching what's next. This is what's next. <laughs> in your mind, what is the next regulatory issue or challenge that we don't spend enough time on today and that we should? Um, why don't we start with you, Commissioner Riley? No, oh, please, uh, my, my, my comment. Oh, no, 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 no. First choice. <laughs> You know, it's an interesting question. I kind of flip it on its, its head. I, I spent a quite a deal, uh, quite a bit of time talking to folks on, on, on things that they think that the commission is going to take action on. Um, so it is very troubling to see. You know, they, they express concerns over things that the commission is going to do. So we don't actually spend uh, enough time, as you highlight, on things that what we should be doing. I, I think that the issue that you've been highlighting in your speeches, in terms of the sp spectrum pipeline, is just so important and so prevalent. It's why we, most of our, my colleagues have been spending a lot of time on this issue and coming up with different ideas on how to 
free the pipeline, do different opportunities so we have spectrum available going forward. Um, I would probably say that that is probably, I would spend a considerable more time on that. Well, I'll answer that way. Thank you. Um, why, don't we, why don't we go this way? Men first, then ladies. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I guess I would uh, suggest two different uh, challenges. First, uh, how do we create a unified set of regulations for people to comply with? This goes back to the earlier <laughs> privacy discussion, but it bleeds into a number of different areas. I hear from a number of different uh, companies, trade associations, et cetera, that people, look, the FCC is involved in this space, but its requirements are duplicative of, in conflict with, uh, the requirements from another agency. And that is a problem. I mean, I think that ideally, uh, we would let the private sector know what the rules of the road are, who is going to be responsible, and not create a situation in which a number of different federal agencies apply distinct requirements and ultimately, in some cases, get into competition to decide who's going to regulate a particular space. That is a dangerous environment, uh, both in terms of the lack of legal authority, but also ultimately in terms of uh, promoting consumer welfare. In addition to that, obviously, you have the 50 states who uh, take their lead as well from the federal government. And so it's trying to navigate the regulatory thicket can be really difficult uh, for, uh, for people uh, who might not necessarily have the means to, uh, to procure legal counsel. Uh, the other challenge, and I'm not sure, I certainly don't have an answer to it, but if you think about uh, the Internet of Things, uh, that is really driving the tremendous growth in the number of devices that are being connected. And so if you look at the traffic projections, obviously, I think it was Cisco's projected something like seven times the data traffic by uh, 2019 that we have today. In addition to that, the number of devices that are going to be connected to the network are going to explode thanks to the Internet of Things. And I have a chance to see everything from a car to an agricultural application uh, on the floor that are going to be connected. How do we ensure that all of these devices communicate with each other or work together well uh, in a way that it preserves uh, the wireless experience for everybody, whether you're using licensed or unlicensed spectrum. That's a real challenge. And along with that go, obviously, a panoply of challenges relating to you know, the security of particular devices. It seems like every day I read a story about a car that was hacked in a controlled experiment, about somebody on an airplane who uses the wi airplane's Wi-Fi signal to change the, the flight course of a flight plan of a plane. I mean, those kinds of things are, uh, are pretty worrying to me as a consumer. And uh, so, I guess those are a few of the things I would try. So women get the last word. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so it should be. Um, what's next? Really short. It's five. I agree with Meredith on that and so many other things. Uh, uh, 5G. We should be spending a lot more time on 5G. We lead the world in 4G, but our leadership in the next is not secure. We should devote more of our time, energy, and resources to making sure that we lead the way. And one other thing we should be doing, and while it's a little bit outside of our jurisdiction, is we have got to commit more research and energy to improving battery life. This great new world of the Internet of Things with an endless number of wearables isn't going to be so interesting if we have to plug ourselves in every several hours. So I think that, that the success of research into battery and the chemical composition of batteries is something that also deserves attention. So Commissioner Clyburn, you get the last word, unless you want to say in health and have a day. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, affordable options, uh, and, and it covers everything that you had up on your game board in terms of what we uh, what we need to concentrate on and how we need to um, you know deploy and what type of you know regulatory tools that we should um, promote to it and enable uh, you know all of these um, opportunities. The people who need what's on the showroom floor the most cannot afford them. And we need to honestly, you know, as a commission and as a nation, uh, work on how we can bridge that opportunities gap. I don't think we spend enough, enough time uh, doing that, and I think um, though many of us um, are uh, fortunate enough to, to not be in certain categories, I think that uh, we are gonna pay a significant price if we don't. And the, and the, uh, the last um, but not least um, is diversity. Uh, we do not spend enough time talking about uh, what the benefits and the opportunities um, and the, uh, of, of diversity. And when I talk about diversity, I'm real broad in terms of that. 
geographic diversity, those of us with Southern accents, you can, I know you can uh, still um, you know, hear it. Um, you know, what do you um, have against New Englanders? <laughs> I think you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, when, when, you, when you, you know, talk about you know, geographic and, and, and age and gender and race, all of these things we need to think about when we talk about um, our, our companies, uh, the focus that we have in terms of our product delivery, connecting the next million um, is going to look a lot different, and we're going to approach it a lot, lot differently than we did the last million. And when we talk about it, connecting the next billion um, worldwide, um, there is um, a, a recognition that, uh, again, we're going to need a different um, a series of paradigms and different uh, you know, people from their own community organically uh, uh, you know, contributing uh, to um, you know, their own uplift. Uh, so those two things I don't think we spend enough time um, on, and I think uh, uh, if we don't, we, none of us will realize our fullest economic and um, other opportunity uh, potential. So fantastic panel. You are all winners, and we are all winners because we have them as our But I still don't get the cars. Okay. <laughs> so I want to thank you guys.